All right, guys. I've decided to go ahead and make a video on fluid and electrolytes. And so if you're one of my students, then you know that this is actually chapter 16 in your med search book around page 270. All right. I don't know. Fluid and electrolytes seems to be the en enemy of the nursing student, so I'm hoping that this will help a little bit. Just don't make it too complicated. Focus on what I say, realizing that I'm hitting the highlights, and this should help you to be able to learn this content easily. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. For my students, I'd like for you to go ahead and take a look at the uh, course learning objectives for fluid and electrolytes. It's always important. Um, it helps you to prepare for the test, and it helps you to understand what content we're actually trying to learn. So go ahead and take a minute, uh, pause the video, and review the CLOs for fluid and electrolytes. You always need to ask yourself when you're uh, studying adult med surge, what are the aging considerations or the gerontological considerations? And when we're looking at the GU system, we're looking at a normal aging process where there's a decrease in the renal blood flow, and that leads to a decrease in the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate. Um, we know because of this, it also leads to a decrease in your creatinine clearance. The kidneys with aging also lose their ability to conserve water and concentrate urine. And we also know that this is compiled with the fact that the elderly have um, an increased loss of water from the skin because we know as the person ages, the skin becomes thinner. So this is also coupled with the fact that the aged population has a decrease in their thirst mechanism and possibly also a decrease in their functional abilities, though this is certainly not the standard. So what do we need to be concerned about? Um, it's important to understand that there are changes but then you also need to ask yourself, what does this lead to? And so the main concerns that we have uh, with the aging population and the GU system or the kidneys would be with drug clearance. So we certainly want to watch drugs that are cleared by the kidneys. We certainly would want to watch any drugs that are nephrotoxic. Okay? And we want to realize that they are certainly at increased risk for dehydration. Okay, uh, first, before we actually get started on this slide, for my students, I want you to make sure that on page 275, you realize that table 16-1, you need to know. These are need-to-know lab values, not just for um, NP2, but they're also need-to-know lab values for your NCLEX exam. So go ahead and put these to memorization and realize that these particular lab values will be addressed on all tests during MP2. Now, and that's table 16-1 on page 271. Then if you want to fast forward in your text, we're actually gonna get started on fluid volume issues, both deficit and excess. Uh, this starts on page 276 in your med surge text, and you'll want to pay attention to the table 16-3. So fluid volume deficit, too little. Okay, that's what you just need to remember. Fluid volume deficits too little. Um, causes can be that you have normal output, but you don't have access or you have deficient intake of uh, water or sodium or improper absorption. Or you can have increased output, but it's not uh, balanced by the fact that we uh, don't have an increased intake. So when you're looking at fluid volume deficit, um, it can result from many issues but it can be as simple as a lack of access to sodium or water, but it also could be from conditions like um, vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, burns, overuse of diuretics, uh, drainage from tubes. So there's many things that can lead to fluid volume deficit, too little fluid. We get to fluid volume excess. It can be caused by um, the output is less than the intake and it can be caused by a decreased output, not balanced by a decreased intake. So when you're looking at fluid volume excess, um, it too can result from many issues, um, such as, you know, oliguria due to end-stage renal disease. It can result from aldosterone excess. Um, that's what happens, for instance, with heart failure. Um, some 
excuse me, someone could be on steroid therapy um, and develop what we call Cushing's from steroid therapy use. Okay, this um, is actually the table from your book. It's on page 276. It's table 16-3. We already talked about it a little bit. Just making sure that you review uh, fluid volume deficit versus excess. We've been over some of the causes. You can look through here. And then it also gives the manifestations or the signs and symptoms of someone who has fluid volume deficit or excess. So just make sure you take a moment to look at this. You review the potential causes. You review the signs and symptoms, making sure that you understand all the terms, right? So uh, remember, usually when there is a fluid issue, there's usually a sodium issue too. So they pretty much go hand in hand. Um, so both issues, because of that, have neurological signs and symptoms, and that's because of the brain cell involvement. Um, next, for fluid volume issues, um, you also need to remember that the heart can be involved. Uh, you want to remember that cardiac output, for instance, is the product of stroke volume and the heart rate. And so when we see a decline in stroke volume, such as you would with fluid volume deficit, you're going to see compensation with the heart rate going up. And that would be a compensatory mechanism. When I'm looking at these, uh, manifestations, for instance, under fluid volume deficit, you can see the neurological signs and symptoms, your restlessness, drowsy, lethargy, confusion, possible seizures, coma. You get your, for your uh, fluid volume deficit, you get the changes, obviously, in your skin. But then there are the cardiac changes right here, your postural hypertension. Um, uh, your postural hypotension. And that would be with an increased pulse rate. That's the compensatory mechanism. Uh, declining CVP. Remember, CVP stands for central venous pressure. It's a reflection of the fluid status on one side of the heart. Uh, remember that the urine is going to be concentrated. We're going to talk in a little bit about specific gravity. You're going to have a decrease uh, in the urinary output. And then, of course, something that's very reliable is that you will see a weight loss. Now, when we're looking at uh, fluid volume excess, we have too much. Once again, you still see neurological signs and symptoms, headache, confusion, lethargy, and seizures, coma. So you can see and just think about your uh, neurological signs and symptoms. But then you get those cardiac signs and symptoms too. You get the JVD, which is your uh, jugular venous distension. You get an S3 heart sound. You guys remember that a uh, normal S1 and S2, but sometimes the development of an S3, which is an extra heart sound, can indicate fluid volume excess. Uh, you can have polyuria, and then um, a good indication too would be weight gain. You guys can take a look at these nursing diagnoses that might be relevant for someone who has uh, the different fluid imbalances uh, for fluid volume deficit. You could see that a nursing diagnosis nursing diagnosis might be deficient fluid volume uh, or the risk for deficient fluid volume, uh, obviously a decreased cardiac output. Uh, one thing that we're concerned about with a fluid volume deficit would be hypovolemic shock. Um, hypovolemic shock is a medical emergency. Okay, It's where your body loses um, at least 20% or more of its volume, uh, whether this be blood or fluid loss. Um, when you think about that, then the heart is left with not being able to pump enough blood to meet the demands of the body, and the patient will have signs and symptoms of severe fluid volume deficit. Um, when we get over to fluid volume excess, you can see some of the nursing diagnosis, obviously excess fluid volume, risk for impaired skin integrity, uh, activity intolerance because of fluid overload, impaired gas exchange, and that leads me to impaired gas exchange. One of the potential complications is what we call pulmonary edema. And again, it is a medical emergency. It is where there's excess fluid accumulation in the lungs, and it makes it difficult uh, for breathing, and it makes it difficult for, uh, to have proper gas exchange. Okay, so for nursing implementation, taking care of someone who has a fluid volume imbalance, 
So my question to you is, what did you find during your assessment? Okay, so you want to couple that information or you want to categorize the information and help yourself to identify, does my patient have a fluid volume deficit versus an excess? So what were your vital signs? Was your blood pressure increase suggestive of hyper of bulimia or fluid volume excess, or did you have a low blood pressure, hypotension, or orthostatic hypotension with a tachycardia, suggestive of fluid volume deficit? Or what, what did the patient look like? What was their neurological status? What about urinary output? Too much, too little? What about skin turgor? Uh, was there tenting, or was there edema? So you wanna ask yourself these questions and when you're in the clinical situ uh, situation, you want to take this information, put it into categories, and try and help yourself understand whether we have fluid volume excess or deficit. Uh, not necessarily nursing implementation, but you need to understand what uh, drives nursing implementation is actual identification and treatment of the underlying cause. We've already gone over the fact that there's many different reasons for someone to have fluid volume deficit or excess, it needs to be identified and that will then help us to manage our patient who's experiencing a fluid imbalance. One thing you need to do when you have someone who has a fluid imbalance is you need to look at your labs. Uh, so for instance, someone who has a fluid volume deficit often has an increased, okay, a BUN, sodium, and hematocrit. So look at your morning labs, okay? And what's going on? Do we have increased BUN sodium uh, hematocrit? Uh, is increased plasma, uh, increased urinary osmolality? What's the specific gravity of the urine? Or for instance, do we have someone <clears throat> with a fluid volume excess where the patient might have a decreased BUN or sodium or hematocrit level? Um, followed with decreased plasma or urine osmo. Remember, you are going to look at specific gravity and readings greater than, for instance, 1.025 indicate that you have concentrated urine. Okay, suggestive of fluid volume deficit where you have a specific gravity, gravity reading of less than 0. Um, 1.010, suggestive of a dilute urine. So make sure that you know specific gravity numbers. So you're looking at your labs. Obviously, you guys, we want to monitor our intake and output. Uh, we want to monitor daily weights. Many times, weighing a patient is the most accurate indication of their fluid status. We're going to look at uh, possibly managing fluids. You guys probably understand that if you have someone who has a fluid volume deficit, uh, if it's mild, we would push oral fluids. If it were severe, then what's the underlying cause? They might need an IV inserted. Uh, we would need to administer blood products if there's a blood loss or maybe some isotonic fluids such as some LR or normal saline. Fluid uh, management for someone who has fluid volume excess, then you're looking at possible diuretic therapy or even possibly a fluid restriction. Now for my students, I want you to remember that posted on Canvas, there is an associated uh, fluid and electrolyte med sheet. You certainly would want to review this and understand uh, the different types of diuretics it's extremely important for NCLEX guys that you understand the different types of diuretics, how they work, and whether they spare potassium or not. The other thing um, that I want to mention here too is a lot of times when we have someone who has a fluid volume deficit or excess, they have associated uh, electrolyte imbalances that will need to be corrected additionally. Okay, so we're actually going to get into sodium imbalances now. Uh, you guys know that uh, sodium is a major <clears throat> extracellular electrolyte and that it's important to understand that it helps with the transmission of nerve impulses, muscle contractility, and the acid-base imbalance. Um, 
Remember that an elevated sodium level, which is hypernatremia, being greater than a sodium level of 145, typically occurs with water loss, such as in dehydration, or a sodium gain. Okay, uh, Your book reminds us that hypernatremia uh, typically is not an issue if you have a patient that is alert, they can drink, they have an intact thirst mechanism, and they can swallow. Low sodium level or hyponatremia, a sodium level less than 135, can occur with water excess, and so it becomes a dilutional issue versus a lack of sodium intake. <clears throat> now, signs and symptoms are listed on page 279, and that's table 16-4. But remember, uh, for hypernatremia, there's a fluid shift. That fluid shift leads to actual shrinkage of cells. This causes the brain cells to shrivel, resulting in neurological signs and symptoms. So when you think of uh, sodium issues, you think of neurological signs and symptoms. Okay? So in hyponatremia, or a low sodium, you have cells that swell, but yet still resulting in neurological signs and symptoms. So in general, what you're going to find with someone who has a sodium imbalance is someone who can experience lethargy, confusion, weakness, uh, they can have seizures, and coma. Also remembering, typically, there is a fluid imbalance associated with hyper or hyponatremia. You can go over the nursing diagnosis for hypernatremia. Certainly there's a risk for injury that could be associated, for instance, with someone having seizure activity. Uh, certainly for a high sodium, you would have the risk for or actual fluid volume deficit and uh, risk for or actual electrolyte imbalance. Concerns that we have when someone has an elevated sodium level would be that they would have seizures and coma and possibly irreversible brain damage. When you look at hyponatremia, you're looking at, again, you know, risk for or actual electrolyte imbalance. They could have a risk for injury, once again, due to declining level of consciousness, seizure activity. Um, they could have acute confusion because of the altered sodium level, and they could have uh, potential complications uh, with severe neurological changes. Okay, so actual treatment or nursing management of someone who ha is experiencing a sodium imbalance. You guys are going to get sick of hearing me say this, but we need to understand the underlying problem and treat the, cro and <clears throat> and treat the cause. If we have someone who has hyperdetremia, uh, your book cautions us about shifting the fluids too quickly, and they could actually develop cerebral edema, which is swelling of the brain cells. So your book suggests that we actually decrease the sodium 8 to 15 milliequivalents per hour, or per 8 hours. That's per 8 hours. So how are we going to do that? Um, what do we have? A primary water deficit? If we have a primary water deficit, then obviously we want to replace with fluids. If it's mild, we could encourage oral fluids. Um, if it's more severe, then we could actually start an IV and give the patient some iso or hypotonic fluids. If it is truly because we have excess sodium, which is unlikely, but if it's truly because we have excess sodium, then we could dilute them <clears throat> with some sodium-free fluids, such as a D5, and promote excretion of the sodium with diuretics. This individual has to be monitored carefully. You guys know that you need to assess the neurostatus and that you would want to place them on seizure precautions and obviously monitor your lab values. All right, if we had someone who had a low sodium or hyponatremia, you need to ask yourself, is this really a fluid loss with sodium loss or is this patient experiencing water intoxication uh, and we actually just have a dilutional issue because the two do warrant different treatments, guys. All right? So if you have a fluid loss, then yes, um, push some oral fluids. Maybe start an IV, give them some isotonic. All right? Um, if it's acute, 
then potentially we could give them some hypertonic solutions, such as a 3% normal saline, but one, I've never seen this done, and two, it can cause a fluid shift, and your patient can end up in fluid overload. So hypertonic saline, like a 3% saline, would be used, I think, rarely, right? Um, <clears throat> so we talked about the hypertonic solutions, um, but let's say it's due to water intoxication, and what we have is truly a dilutional issue, guys, then what you would want to do is a fluid restriction. So we just have to identify what's going on. Uh, the book actually also speaks to the danger of correcting this sodium or hyponatremia too quickly. It says you shouldn't change it more than 8 to 12 milliequivalents per uh, 24 hours. Again, this patient is at um, risk for injury due to neurological changes, so assess neurostatus and place on seizure precautions. Okay, let's move on to potassium imbalances. If you are following along in your book, for now, whoops, sorry guys, we are now, for instance, on page 280 and review table 16-5 for potassium imbalances. So we know that potassium is mainly intracellular and that it is important for transmission and conduction of your nerve and muscle impulses, cell growth, maintenance of cardiac rhythms, and acid-base balance. So when we're looking at hyperkalemia, high potassium level, you know that this is the potassium level greater than 5. Uh, it can be dangerous, potentially life-threatening, and that is because it can cause abnormal electrical conduction in the heart, and uh, potentially produce some pretty life-threatening uh, dysrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms, okay? So um, high potassium levels most often are associated with impaired renal excretion. That's the number one reason, someone who has like end-stage renal disease, for instance. It can also be caused by uh, a condition that would shift uh, the potassium from inside the cell to outside the cell. And this, for instance, happens with uh, acidosis or a massive cell destruction, such as like in burns, rhabdomyolysis. It could uh, be caused by uh, too much intake. Possibly we have someone on potassium supplements or someone is consuming a large amount in their diet. Signs and symptoms are actually listed on page 281. Uh, they could include some leg cramping, some weak or potentially paralyzed muscles, uh, some abdominal cramping. The main thing that we want to learn about, though, is that it can cause cardiac dysrhythmias. So we're specifically going to look at those cardiac dysrhythmias. So when you're looking at an EKG tracing or ECG tracing, you're looking <clears throat> at the top, you're looking at someone who has a normal EKG, okay? So this is a normal EKG. And so what we're looking at here is what we call the P. Here's the P wave. Here's the Q, here's the R, here's the S, and this is the T. So you can see that it is rounded and it is of normal size or amplitude. So when that's normal, so one of the changes that you could actually see on EKG tracing with someone who is suffering from hyperkalemia is initially this, what we call, tall peaked T wave. So you can see the difference in the two. So that's the initial thing that you'll notice. And this is why when someone has hyperkalemia, it's important to implement cardiac monitoring. You know how we talked about sodium issues? We talked about neuro. We talked about seizure precautions. Now we're talking about potassium. We're talking about cardiac issues. And we're talking about cardiac monitoring. So this individual needs to be placed on a cardiac monitor. We need to look for the tall peaked T waves. You can, if left untreated, see additional changes. You can see how your P wave actually becomes flat. You could have a prolonged conduction, 
which would be reflected by the PR interval, and you could have what we call ST segment depression, where this particular area right here does not return to the isoelectric line. All right, some potential nursing diagnosis could be risk for activity intolerance or actual activity intolerance, and that could be related to the muscular weakness that could come from hyperkalemia. Actual or risk for electrolyte imbalance, you could have a risk for injury, certainly uh, if the patient is experiencing cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, and then, obviously, a potential complication could be uh, dysrhythmias. Um, dysrhythmias that are associated with Hyperkalemia could include, for instance, heart blocks, uh, ventricular fibrillation, which is a rhythm that does not offer any cardiac output or perfusion, or cardiac standstill. So how are we going to treat hyperkalemia? Obviously, you want to eliminate oral or parenteral uh, potassium intake. The parenteral, this is a nursing responsibility. It is your responsibility to organize your day clinically, and one of those would be to actually look at labs. You look at labs, you see that the potassium is elevated. It possibly is getting close to five, at five or higher. You know that your pa patient's fluids contain potassium. It is your responsibility to make sure that they are discontinued, okay? Also looking at any other sources of potassium intake. We can increase the elimination of potassium. This is often done with diuretics, for instance, loop or thiazide diuretics, and we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about these on the next slide. You can actually um, administer k -exalate. That can be given as an enema, or it can be given orally. It actually binds with potassium in the um, bowel and helps to eliminate potassium that way. Mm, you can actually shift the potassium back into the cell where it belongs. This can be done by giving IV insulin. Hopefully by now you know the only source of uh, IV insulin is regular. So if we give someone uh, regular insulin, IV push, and they're not a diabetic, obviously it has to be followed with some D50. But this is a temporary fix until we can get to the underlying problem. You can also cause a shift, let's say for instance that the hyperkalemia is the result of an acidosis. Maybe your patient needs bicarb to help correct the acidosis. Or maybe we could give them some beta adrenergic agonist. Uh, this could be done orally, uh, IV inhalation therapy, and that too will help shift the potassium back into the cell where it belongs. Um, we can reverse membrane effects um, to stabilize the cell membrane and we can do this by administering IV calcium gluconate or chlorine. But if someone is getting IV calcium gluconate or chlorine, this individual is on a cardiac monitor and continuous blood pressure monitoring and must be watched closely. Someone who is suffering, for instance, hyperkalemia because of end-stage renal disease, it's possible their fix is going to have to be hemodialysis. And as I mentioned earlier, someone who has potassium issues needs to be monitored so they need a cardiac monitor and we know that we're watching the EKG tracing and in particular for someone who has hyperkalemia we are watching um, for tall peaked T waves. And just a reminder for my students that you do need to understand the difference in the classes of diuretics and so for if someone has uh, hyperkalemia, obviously we would want to give them a loop or a thiazide diuretic, so you would want to look at this chart, look how it works, and nursing considerations for someone who is taking these particular medications. Okay, so a low potassium or hypokalemia is a potassium level that is below 3.5. So we see hypokalemia, for instance, when there's an increased loss uh, via the kidneys or the GI tract. So maybe this is someone who has excessive or overuse of diuretics. Or for GI issues, it could be over excessive use of laxatives, or maybe they have severe vomiting and diarrhea. There could be a shift of the little bit of extracellular potassium that there is. There is extra shifted into the cell or they have an inadequate amount of potassium in their diet, but this um, 
is not a common cause of hypokalemia. When we're looking at signs and symptoms, once again with low potassium, the most serious issue would be those of cardiac nature. You can have some skeletal muscle weakness, um, and that can also get into respiratory muscle weakness. Uh, decreased gut motility, and uh, you can actually get into some hyperglycemia. Again, at the top, guys, we are looking at what would be considered a normal EKG. And so you can see how rounded the T wave is. And so initial changes for someone who's experiencing hypokalemia could be, th could be that they have a shallow T wave and they could suffer from some ST segment depression. So once again, we would want to make sure that this patient was on a cardiac monitor and that we were watching uh, the EKG tracing to see if there are any changes. You can review the nursing diagnosis and again potential complications just as with, with hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia could be dysrhythmias. Again, you could have issues with heart blocks, uh, possible ventricular dysrhythmias that would be non-perfusing. Okay, so nursing implementation for hypokalemia. Hopefully we can just use the GI tract and give them oral supplements. If not, then we could have to actually give them IV supplementation. But there's some definite safety considerations that we need to be concerned about when giving potassium IV. So first of all, uh, these are listed in your book on page 283, table 16.6. One, we never push potassium straight. It'll stop the heart, okay? So it has to be diluted. The more you can dilute it, the better it is because it is caustic or hard on the veins. So we will never give it push or as a bolus. It will always be diluted and we should not exceed 10 milliequivalents per hour, especially outside of the critical care setting. And the reason we don't want to exceed the 10 milliequivalents an hour is because it can lead to hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest. Um, we can also encourage an increased consumption of potassium. And for my students, there is a table in your book, page 4611, towards the back of your book, that actually you know outlines the things that we know. Your citrus fruits, your dates, your bananas, your potatoes with the skin, um, as far as good sources of potassium. Also, you know, we've already talked about put them on a cardiac monitor, monitor your serum drug levels. Um, just a little check your practice, which is in your book. What happens if someone is taking furosemide, which is a loop diuretic and digitalis? And we just need to remember the combination of those drugs can be dangerous to your patient. Digitalis, digitalis is a cardiac glycoside. It's essentially usually give given to regulate the heart rhythm and the heart rate. But if someone has a low potassium or hypokalemia, it actually intensifies the effects of the DIG and can make a patient appear DIG toxic, even though their DIG levels would be within normal level. So again, the combination of furosemide, which is Lasix, which is a loop diuretic and digitalis, can be a dangerous combination for your patient. When someone is on both of these medicines, we need to make sure that this patient has a normal potassium level. All right, guys, we're gonna move on to calcium imbalances. We're gonna pick up the speed a little bit for these last few electrolyte imbalances. Uh, calcium imbalances um, are on page, is on page 283, and table 16.7 is a great spot to review. We know we need calcium uh, for nerve transmission and myocardial contractions and muscle contractions. Um, when we have someone who has, for instance, <clears throat> uh, hypercalcemia, then it's typically uh, hyperparathyroidism is the issue. Most people don't even know they have hyperparathyroidism. They show up, they have hypercalcemia, it's diagnosed, okay? So most of the cases for hypercalcemia are related to hyperparathyroidism.
Uh, otherwise, malignancies, um, unfortunately, especially if they're in the bone, can cause hypercalcemia and then prolonged immobilization. If we're looking at hypocalcemia, you're looking at someone usually because they have a decreased production of the parathyroid hormone. Uh, this is especially um, the case if someone has had part of or the parathyroid gland removed. It can also happen when someone has multiple blood transfusions. There's a process when they clean the blood that actually lowers the level of calcium. So we have to be concerned about someone who's having multiple blood transfusions. Um, alkalosis can also result in hypocalcemia as can an increased calcium loss. When we're looking at someone <clears throat> who has a calcium imbalance, uh, generally both hyper and hypo, they experience lethargy, weakness, and fatigue. And then for hypocalcemia, they can actually experience depression. They also have changes in their blood pressure and reflexes. So with hyper, you can have an elevated blood pressure and a decrease in reflexes. And then with hypo, it would be the opposite. Additionally, with hypo, we can get into some serious muscle issues. Patients could have what we call laryngeal spasms. The spasms could be so severe that they compromise the patient's airway. They can get into tetany, which is sustained muscle contractions and seizures. Okay, so tests for hypocalcemia include actual clinical signs if a patient were positive for either of these of tetany, which is a sustained muscle contraction. Okay, so we have the top one, which is Chostek uh, sign, and so you would actually lightly tap over the facial nerve in front of the ear, and if the patient had a muscle spasms, that would be positive, could be a sign of tetany, and hypocalcemia. The bottom one, we are actually inflating a blood pressure cuff above the patient's systolic blood pressure. And if within three minutes they have spasms of the hand, carpal spasms, then that is what we call a positive trousseau, which could be a sign of tetany or hypocalcemia. So these are tests for hypocalcemia. All right, so you want to know these tests for hypocalcemia. All right, you guys can kind of read through these uh, various nursing diagnoses. As you can see, it ends up being kind of redundant as we go through these. All of them are the same as far as risk for actual electrolyte imbalance. And then they kind of, a lot of them are risk for injury. The risk for injury actually could be due to different things. For instance, for hypercalcemia, the risk for injury could be uh, due to the fact that the patient could have dysrhythmias. Um, the risk for injury for hypocalcemia would be due to the fact that the patient could actually have tetany, which could be like laryngeal spasms and that could compromise the airway. All right, guys, so for nursing implementation, obviously, what have I been saying? Identify the underlying cause and treat it, right? And so for hypercalcemia, you could actually encourage the excretion of calcium with loop diuretics. Um, if it's mild, then obviously we would want to stop any medications that could contribute uh, to the high calcium levels, uh, limit uh, the intake of calcium in the diet, you know, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Uh, lots of fluid, like three to four liters a day, and this is mainly to prevent kidney stones and exercise. Uh, if it is uh, severe, the hypercalcemia is severe, then we could actually insert an IV and start isotonic fluids or maybe administer um, a biphosphonate. Uh, in your worksheet, the fluid and electrolyte med review worksheet, I actually uh, call uh, biphosphonate, biphosphonate a phosphate binder. Uh, several lamer, um, and this would actually help to bind with and excrete the calcium. And then if it, that takes a few days to work, though, that's an oral medication, and so it's possible that if the um, hypercalcemia is severe, we would want to go ahead and give them some uh, calcitonin, which would work more rapidly and can be given an IV form.
Okay, so that's for hypercalcemia. Uh, again, hypocalcemia, treat the underlying cause. Uh, it would be nice if we could give them an oral supplement. Uh, if we're going to give them IV calcium gluconate or chloride, again, remember, we would actually have to place this patient on a cardiac monitor and a blood pressure monitor and watch them extremely close, okay? So um, I just want to remind you guys that if the issue for hypocalcemia is because they had surgery, then that would need to be monitored closely after surgery if we remove their parathyroid gland. Or it's possible the cause could be due to the patient receiving radiation around the neck area, right? Um, hypocalcemia obviously encourage a diet that's high in calcium. Uh, I think I said give them supplements. And only if it were severe would we do the IV calcium gluconate or chloride. If the patient was actually alkalotic because they're having like an anxiety attack, you could actually have them rebreathe into a paper bag. And uh, that would help with the respiratory alkalosis, which was actually driving the hypocalcemia. Okay, your phosphate imbalances, guys, is on page 285. You want to make sure that you look at uh, table 16-8. Okay. Um, we know that uh, phosphate uh, is intracellular. We know that it's necessary uh, for muscle, the function of muscles in the nervous system, we know it mainly exists in the bones and the teeth. Um, we see phosphate imbalances a lot of times in individuals who have poor kidney function. If someone has hyperphosphatemia, then you're looking at somebody who has a phosphate level greater than 4.4. Usually, again, poor kidney function. Uh, your signs and symptoms for people who have phosphate imbalances, remember, are very similar to those who have calcium imbalances because there's an inverse relationship and they pretty much go hand in hand, okay? So for hypercalcemia, you would see hypocalcemia. You would see numbness, tingling, muscle cramps. Remember, we just talked about what tetany is and possible seizures. If uh, someone had hyperphosphatemia, then we would obviously want to restrict foods and um, fluids that were high in phosphorus. We just mentioned phosphate binding agents. We could give those to these individuals. Make sure they're adequately hydrated. Okay. It's possible if their phosphate imbalance is related to the fact that they have end-stage renal disease, they might actually need hemodialysis. For someone who has hypophosphatemia, then we have a phosphate level less than 2.4. This is usually a nutritional issue, such as malabsorption, or you know, there's some kind of lack of, of absorption in the intestinal tract, and a lot of your signs and symptoms are like an individual who has hypercalcemia. So if someone has hypophosphatemia, we would want to give them oral supplements, encourage flu foods that were high in phosphorus, such as, you know, dairy, milk, and possibly give them sodium or potassium phosphate. And last but not least, your magnesium imbalances, okay? So this is on page uh, 285 and look at table 16-9. So if someone has a mag uh, hypermagnesium, then we have a magnesium level level greater than 2.5. Uh, we see this once again in kidney disease. Uh, if, for instance, someone is getting too much IV ma magnesium, which would be the case in someone who is pregnant and maybe suffering from preeclampsia or eclampsia, uh, if maybe they have ingestion of too many laxatives or antacids. What do you see for hypermagnesium? You see lethargy, uh, drowsiness, muscle weakness, uh, some urinary issues, maybe nausea and vomiting. Uh, de uh, decreased tendon reflexes. Uh, so if we have someone with hypermagnesium, we would restrict the magnesium intake. Emergency treatment could be to give them IV calcium uh, chloride or gluconate, and we've talked about that a few times, but to also give them uh, IV loop diuretics such as furosemide, uh, which helps promote the excretion of magnesium.
And in worst case scenario, especially if it's related to end-stage renal disease, we've talked about this a lot, that this patient might actually need hemodialysis. When you're looking at someone who has hypomagnesium, you're looking at someone who has a magnesium level less than uh, 1.5. We see this in people who have chronic alcoholism. Uh, we see it uh, in people who have significant GI losses and who have nutritional issues. Uh, signs and symptoms that you might see, confusion, muscle cramps, uh, tremors, seizure, vertigo, uh, increased uh, tendon reflexes, um, and then we talked about the Shovstex and the Trousseau signs, then those might be positive. Again, treat the underlying cause. We could possibly give them supplements, increase the dietary intake of magnesium, or possibly give them parenteral uh, magnesium when they have a severe deficit. All right, guys, just make sure we stay connected. If you're one of my students, you know my uh, college email. If you are following me um, on YouTube, please join my channel. And if you have questions or want a copy of anything, just uh, email me at nurse.poly.rn at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at nursepolyrn. And then also, just make sure that you check out uh, the website, thefancybadger.com, for fantastic nur uh, nursing badge reels. Thank you uh, for listening, and let me know if you guys have any questions.